The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sporty's free webinar series. Tonight we are talking Garmin Autopilot. It's a very hot topic. We know that by virtue of the popularity of everyone registering for tonight. We certainly have a crowded classroom, so we're happy to see that as well. Before we get too much further, let me introduce myself. My name is Eric Radke. I'm on the, the Sporty's uh, training team, Sporties Academy, based at the Claremont County Airport, the home office, and I am serving as your facilitator for this evening. We are very pleased to have with us um, members of the Garmin Aviation Training Team, beginning with Al Matson, uh, who's a senior aviation training content development developer with, with Garmin, who is going to be leading our presentation tonight. And before we get to Al, uh, I just a few housekeeping items to review. Tonight's presentation, number one, is being recorded. So uh, rest easy if you have to step away. If you miss an important point that you would like to see or hear recapped, you will be able to do that starting tomorrow when the entire presentation will be available in the Sporties webinar archives at sporties.com slash webinars. It'll also be available via the Sporties YouTube channel. So you can check back for that and you can review and review as often as you would like. We also have interactivity uh, available in the GoToWebinar platform that we are using tonight. In that, you are welcome uh, to submit questions throughout the presentation. We will not uh, delay or, or break up the live presentation, but what we will do is we will collect those questions and we'll reserve some time at the end to field those questions to the entire group. Meanwhile, while the presentation is going on, I'd also like to make mention that Matt Clark, also a member of the Garmin Aviation Training Team, will be working to respond uh, to as many questions as he can. Uh, it likely won't be possible for him to get to all of the questions, but you'll see some information during the presentation um, to be able to submit questions after the presentation at a later time if we're not able to get to everyone. So that kind of concludes the housekeeping items. With that, let me say that I think I share the same sentiment with the rest of the aviation community that we were so excited back in July um, to have you know, seen Garmin as they are known to do, kind of stand the aviation world on end with the announcement of the GFC and 500 and 600 autopilot systems kind of building on the very popular GFC 700 platform. Like so much of what you see uh, out of Garmin Aviation, um, these are feature rich, high value economical autopilot solutions that are sure to be game changers uh, when it comes to safety enhancements. So we're happy to be learning more tonight from the experts themselves. That's Garmin Aviation. And with that, I am pleased to welcome once again, Al Matson uh, from the Garmin Aviation Training Team. Al, welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the for the great introduction. Um, and and a welcome to everybody to this webinar on the GFC 500 and GFC 600 autopilot systems. Uh, again, my name is Al Matson. I'm part of that training development team at Garmin Aviation. A uh, little bit about my background here, uh, I was an instructor at Northwest Airlines where I was typerated on the DC-9. And uh, after that, I went and developed pilot training and safety programs for three different airlines. Most recently, I developed the Part 142 certified training program for the Vision Jet at Cirrus Aircraft. I have a type rating on that airplane as well, and, and I was privileged uh, to be able to fly that for about 250 hours. And now I get to work with some amazing products and people at Garmin Aviation. So uh, the objectives of this session are to provide you with a basic overview of the autopilot systems, which basically is gonna prepare you for some in-person hands-on training and enable you to hit the ground running when you start using the GFC 500 or GFC 600 in, in your aircraft. However, do keep in mind that you know this is a, a webinar meant to provide, it's not meant to provide comprehensive training um, on these systems. Once you have it installed, we'd suggest that you spend time with a qualified instructor until you develop proficiency in operating your pilot, autopilot system. So um, we definitely wanna answer your questions, address any uh, requests that you might have. You can enter questions into the chat window for the webinar. And at the end of the presentation, I'll address as many of those questions as possible. 
And you can also send an email to us. Uh, we'll, we'll have this email address that you see on the bottom of the screen here. And if, if you don't get it written down in time here, don't worry, it's showing the upper right hand corner of all the slides throughout the presentation. Um, and also note that we won't, will not be addressing aircraft STC prioritization, installation related questions, or specific airplane or airframe questions here. Uh, for those types of questions, we're going to refer, refer you to your dealer. And we'll have a dealer locator web address uh, at the end of this presentation. So uh, here we go. Let's dig in, take a look at the all new GFC 500, GFC 600 autopilot systems. The uh, benefits to be realized from these systems are that they're very cost effective as a retrofit autopilot solution. They have a lower cost of ownership that's derived from the design of the systems. And anyone who's flown an aircraft with a GFC 700 will have a great idea just how smooth an autopilot can be. And you can expect the same experience from both of these systems. Uh, they also have a robust feature set that includes some very advanced safety features not previously seen in retrofit autopilots. So uh, there are features common to both of these systems. Uh, these are solid state digital autopilot systems that borrow technology from the Garmin GFC 700. They're attitude based rather than rate based and they use AHERS based technology. Uh, the standard systems are two axis pitch and roll while having provisions for adding the yaw axis. The uh, systems provide for flight director command bars to be displayed uh, when you have an appropriate type of equipment installed. These command bars are great for hand flying and are used by the autopilot system. The systems also have built in GPS roll steering capability and when interfaced with, with the appropriate navigation equipment, provide the ability to fly GPS, ILS, VR, localizer, and the ever popular back course approaches. With the installation of a remote mounted go around button, you can fly a coupled go around and if equipped with an appropriate GPS navigator, you can fly the full missed approach procedure while remaining on autopilot. Both of these systems provide for pre-selecting capturing altitudes and allow for climbs and descents using indicated airspeed mode. The vertical navigation or, or VNAV function is a growth mode and will become available with an appropriate navigator installed. Adding a yaw servo to either system adds yaw damper mode, which is great for keeping the airplane coordinated and can help to mitigate any Dutch roll tendencies. One of the tremendous safety features of these systems is the electronic stability and protection or ESP. This provides flight envelope protection while hand flying. ESP correct for bank, pitch, and airspeed exceedances by providing corrective control inputs that increase in force with increasing levels of exceedance. If, ES, if this ESP feature activates for more than 10 seconds during a 20 second time period, the level mode will activate to bring the vertical speed to zero and bring the wings to level, while an oral alert will announce engaging autopilot. Okay, so how does this ESP work? Well, in a bank exceeding 45 degrees, the servos will activate to bring the plane back towards level flight. And the greater the bank exceedance beyond 45 degrees, the greater the corrective force becomes. Once at a bank angle of less than 30 degrees, the corrective force deactivates. And with a compatible display, you'll see this two bar ESP bank limiter displayed at the 45 degree mark and when activated, it moves to the 30 degree mark. Pitching up or down beyond airframe specific limits is also discouraged by the system. Again, with increasing corrective force applied with increased exceedances to bring the nose up or down as required. ESP also provides high speed and low speed protection. If the aircraft is exceeding VNE, the nose is pitched upwards to reduce airspeed. When properly equipped with a valid train database, e ESP can also provide low speed protection. So that as the aircraft approaches a stalled condition, a force is applied to lower the nose. This feature is always dis disabled below 200 feet AGL. And if you're getting the idea, that this is a bit like having an, an instructor board to nudge you in the correct direction, you're right. 
And don't worry, there is a provision for disabling ESP for those times when you want to go out, practice your steep turns, chandelles, or lazy eights. And I know everybody loves to do those things. The systems also provide overspeed protection when the autopilot is on. Overspeed protection is active with the autopilot on and in certain descent modes. If the aircraft exceeds V&E, say because the pilot forgot to reduce thrust during the descent, the nose will automatically pitch up, a max speed message will display, and the vertical mode of the autopilot will change to indicated airspeed, while changing the previous vertical mode to armed. Once you correct that overspeed condition, on this, this example, we do that by re reducing the thrust, the previous vertical mode will become active once again. Underspeed protection is also active with autopilot on. This is designed to discourage operation below a predetermined speed. When slowing to this airspeed, a visual alert of min speed will be displayed and the nose will pitch down automatically to prevent a stall. At this point, the autopilot mode will change to active indicated airspeed mode. Uh, and during operation of certain altitude critical modes, you'll also hear an oral alert of airspeed, which repeats every five seconds until airspeed increases. Once the underspeed condition is resolved, the active vertical mode changes to the previously selected mode again. Both systems have onboard system health monitoring which is constantly monitoring and comparing, comparing values within the system. And if a fault is sensed, the autopilot will disengage. And if this were to happen, you definitely know about it because you can receive visual and auditory alerts. Both the GFC 500 and 600 use what we call smart servos. They have onboard microprocessors that sense torque and speed values, and they use these to apply appropriate control inputs for the conditions. They have a brushless motor design and no mechanical slip clutch, which improves reliability and reduces maintenance costs. So let's take a look at the GFC 500 now. This system was designed for less complex single engine piston aircraft. A basic GFC 500 system would look like this. It would have a mode controller, a G5 electronic flight instrument, and have servos for roll and pitch. Adding a GMU-11 magnetometer to the system provides heading information. And it's optional when using a G5 as an attitude indicator and required when installed as a directional gyro or horizontal situation indicator. Adding a pitch trim servo provides for automatic pitch trim management while on autopilot it also provides for manual electric trim when you're hand flying. Adding a yaw servo provides for the yaw damper feature, which minimizes yaw oscillations and helps to maintain coordinate flight. A GAD 29B adapter provides for interfacing with selected GPS or VHF navigators. And this is the GMC 507 mode controller. You'll see that it's divided into three logically arranged sections. On the left side, you have lateral mode selections. In the center are autopilot engagement selections. And on the right side, you see the vertical mode selections. You can also see the indicator lights above the selectors showing which modes have been selected. On the top left, you see the heading track knob that can be depressed to sync to your current heading or track and turned left or right to select desired, desired heading or track. Heading mode is used to stay on a selected heading. Track mode is used to follow chosen track. And nav mode provides for following guidance provided by a navigator input. And approach mode or APR mode will capture and track both lateral and vertical guidance during approaches. Pressing AP engages or disengages the autopilot system and activates the flight director. If you desired to hand fly with the flight director guidance only, you would press the FD key rather than the AP key. The blue level key, LVL, activates a great safety feature built into these systems. Pressing it will bring the aircraft's vertical speed to zero while bringing the wings level. 
The YD key is for engaging the AW damper if that servo is installed as part of the system. And just uh, so you know that when you press autopilot on, if you have the yaw damper installed, that would automatically activate that as well. In the vertical mode selection section of the controller, we have the down up wheel, which is used to make adjustments to other modes. When climbing out from the airport, you would press IAS to capture the current indicated airspeed, and then you use the down up wheel to adjust the airspeed to, to the desired value, typically VY. During descents, you would select the VS key to activate the vertical speed mode and then roll the down up wheel in the down direction. Each click of the wheel adds 100 feet per minute to the descent rate. The VNAV key is reserved for future growth of this system and pressing the ALT key captures the current altitude. If a captured altitude need to be adjusted up to 150 feet, the down up wheel can be rolled in either direction with each click of the wheel providing a 10 foot change of altitude. This is the G5 electronic flight instrument, which is a required part of the system. If you already have one of these installed in your aircraft, the GFC 500 autopilot system can be purchased without this display. This display fits into a standard three and one eighth inch cutout in the panel, so no special panel modifications are required. The display is brightly lit, allowing for easy reading and full sunlight conditions. And the displays have built-in GPS, which provides for highly accurate ground speed and track readouts, and an air data and attitude heading reference system, or ADAHARS. A lithium IM backup battery can be installed in the back of the G5 dis display to provide up to four hours of emergency power. This is a re required for the G5 installed as an attitude display, and it's optional when installed as a DG or HSI display. While only one G5 is required for the GFC 500 system, many pilots will no doubt choose to add a second G5, providing one for flight instrumentation and one for navigation. This also provides backup redundancy with dual ADAHARs and a reversionary mode where if the flight instrumentation display failed, the second G5 will switch from the navigation display to the flight instrumentation display mode. Installation is relatively easy with inputs for pilot pitot-static, a remote WAS GPS antenna, and an interface for a Garmin GNS or GTN navigator. The on-off key is pretty easy to find on the G5. Pressing it once turns the system on, and once on, you can press the key momentarily to adjust display backlighting. To turn the display off, you just press and hold the key for five seconds. Of course, these units will turn on and off automatically with your avionics bus as well. An ambient light sensor is provided to provide for automatic adjustments for, of backlighting. A data card is provided for software updates, and by leaving a card in the slot, you can log flight data for later analysis. Uh, by the way, this slot takes a micro SD card uh, up to 32 gigabytes in size. The way to access menus is by pressing the control knob. Once the menu appears, the knob is turned to make a selection, and the knob is again pressed to choose the selected item. If adjusting a value such as barometric pressure, the knob is turned to make the adjustment and then press to accept that entry. And then the menu will disappear. While input can be made using the G5 display, inputs made on the GMC 507 mode controller will also appear on the G5 display. You can pre-select an altitude, which will appear in a box above the altitude tape, with a bug appearing on the altitude altimeter tape at the selected altitude. Selecting a heading on the GMC 507 mode controller will move a bug on the heading display to, to the selected heading. Vertical speed can be observed on this tape, which is marked in 100 foot increments with the current vertical rate marked by a white pointer. Airspeed is displayed on this tape and a bug will appear next to the selected indicated airspeed when that mode is selected on the autopilot controller. 
reference V speeds are displayed just to the right of the airspeed tape. The values for these airspeeds are set up by the user for each airplane. Barometric pressure is easily adjusted simply by turning the control knob. Information on this display includes an artificial horizon, a pitch scale with a mark every two and one half degrees, an attitude indicator with markings at 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60 degrees of bank, a slip skid indicator, and a turn rate indicator with a magenta trend vector indicator. An airspeed indicator showing the current airspeed in a black background box with a magenta trend vector showing the predicted airspeed in six seconds if conditions remain unchanged. An altimeter with the current altitude showing in a black box along with a magenta trend vector showing the predicted altitude in six seconds again if conditions remain unchanged. And the vertical speed indicator also has a trend vector. Flight director command bars display in solid magenta while on autopilot and will appear with a hollowed out magenta bar while on flight director only. The autopilot status indications appear at the top center area of the display with engagement status on the left side, lateral mode in the center, and vertical mode on the right side. Localizer and vertical guidance can be seen here. And ground speed is shown in the lower left of the display. Here you'll see uh, you know, if you've lost your main power source, the remaining battery power meter will appear in the upper left side of the display showing the time remaining uh, on battery power. And here we have the G5 shown in the navigation display mode. So once again, you press the control knob to access menus, select an item by rotating the knob and then turn the knob to adjust values. Values are then accepted by pushing the knob. On this dis display, we see a directional gyro representation, course deviation and vertical guidance indications, the current heading, and a selected heading with a bug, and also a ground track indicator shown with a gray dash line and magenta pointer on the outside of the DG representation. Again, we see ground speed shown in the lower left, similar to the indication on the flight instrumentation display. And on the upper left of this display, you'll see the distance to the next waypoint. Now, as previously mentioned, these Garmin autopilots use smart servos that sense torque and speed and adjust the control surface movement based on these inputs. And that's what's producing that smooth, very smooth control feel. And it's worth noting that the STC for the G5 allows the displays to be used as a primary attitude indicator or as a backup attitude ind indicator with a primary rate of turn indicator. And when in display uh, navigation display mode, they can be used as a DG or as an HSI. So installers uh, need to consider the STC limitations prior to installation. Okay, so now we'll move on to the GFC 600, which is intended for high performance, piston single and multi-engine, as well as turbine powered aircraft. These are aircraft that have a wider performance range and will experience flight in a more demanding flight environments than a typical single engine piston airplane will encounter. The GFC 600 design offers the flexibility to interface with a wide variety of avionics equipment, commonly found in general aviation aircraft. Starting with a similar setup to this, you could still have a large number of features available to you. Adding a pitch trim servo would provide automatic pitch trim while on autopilot and also manual electric trim while hand flying. Adding a yaw trim servo will provide for yaw damper functionality, again, to minimize yaw oscillations and help maintain coordinated flight. 
Adding the GI-285 enunciator panel places your autopilot status and mode enunciations up into your field of view, something that would be required if you, if you don't have the appropriate uh, display right in front of you. And here's what we consider the optimal configuration for the GFC 600. With a GTN 650-750 navigator and a GFD 500-600 PFD-MFD display, or the new TXI series that actually was just announced today, this will enable low speed protection, flight director command bars, GPS navigation and approaches, coupled missed approaches, and selected altitude capture. So with, with these types of displays installed, uh, you wouldn't need to have the mode enunciations with that automatic flight control system status uh, because you'd have it shown right at the top of your uh, PFD display. So here we look at the uh, GI-285 mode enunciator, which is providing those enunciations and autopilot status indications. Again, you need to have these in your primary field of view. The white indications show that a mode is armed, green shows active modes, and if you were to see yellow, it's just gonna reflect an abnormal condition, such as an out of trim condition. With LED lights, it's very reliable, and keep in mind that with a Garmin PFD as part of your system, you would not need to install one of these since you would have those indications at the top of the PFD display. As mentioned earlier, this system is compatible with a wide range of aircraft performance characteristics and is intended for high performance single and twin engine pistol, piston aircraft as well as turbine powered aircraft. It's designed as a standalone autopilot and is capable of performing many basic autopilot functions with the input of only airspeed and altitude data from an external source. However, with extensive input output capabilities supporting a large variety of equipment, you can enable a large feature set by interfacing the GFC 600 with appropriate external flight displays and navigation equipment. You'll see a USB port provided on the front panel to enable easy software updating and to provide for diagnostic downloads to aid in troubleshooting. And yes, I know what you're thinking here, but no, you can't charge your phone or power other devices from this port. On the left side of the front panel are the engagement mode selections. Pressing AP engages the autopilot with default mode being roll and pitch as shown here. Pressing AP will also illuminate the indicated light next to the FD key and again, FD may be selected separately if desired for guidance while hand flying. The YD key is for engaging the yaw damper. And this will also illuminate when you press the AP key as the yaw damper engages automatically when the autopilot is engaged. Green lights indicate the system is engaged and functioning properly. Flashing yellow AP LED indicates manual dis disengagement of the autopilot. And along with this, you're gonna hear the AP disconnect tone sound twice. You also see the flashing yellow AP LED with a trim failure or mistrim condition. A message will appear on the right side of the display area to indicate the issue. And there is no tone associated with this indication. A flashing red AP LED tells you the autopilot is disengaged automatically, and you're gonna hear the oral tone alert with this, this condition as well. This could be to a failure with an autopilot system, a loss of air data inputs, loss of GPS input, strong turbulence, or just exceeding the engagement uh, attitude limits of the autopilot. A flashing yellow FD LED indicates that an active mode of the autopilot was automatically dropped, such as would, what would happen if an ILS signal was lost while making an approach. In this case, the default modes of roll and pit will become active. The LCD display area has three sections. On the left is the lateral mode selection, in the center is the vertical mode area, and on the right is the system's message area. Pressing the AP key by itself will engage the system in roll mode. 
That's again the default mode for the system. If the autopilot is on and in any other lateral mode, pressing that modes key will place the autopilot back into roll mode. Heading mode directs the autopilot to turn to and track the selected heading. Nav mode directs the autopilot to track the course provided by the selected navigation source. If selected while in heading mode, nav will arm for capture as the aircraft is flown towards the course line. APR is approach mode, which arms the system to capture both lateral guidance and vertical guidance when available. BC is used when flying those all popular back course approaches. The keys on the right side of are the vertical mode selectors. Pit or pitch is the default mode here, and so it will be the active mode when first engaging the autopilot. Unless you've already been using the flight director for hand flying another mode. VNV or vertical navigation is reserved for future system growth and will provide for program descents. Pressing IAS will capture the current indicated airspeed which can then be adjusted using that nose down up wheel. IS is typically used in climbs, but it can also be used in descents, which could be helpful in a, in a, especially in a busy terminal area to make sure that you don't exceed certain speeds. Selecting VS engages the vertical speed mode and will capture the current vertical speed of the aircraft. So pressing VS is typically followed by moving the nose down up wheel in the appropriate direction to arrive at the desired vertical speed. One click of that wheel is 100 feet per minute. So if you press VS while level, you can simply count the kick clicks to arrive at your desired feet per minute. The selected vertical speed will also display in the front panel of the GMC 605 mode controller and as a bug on your PFD. Pressing the ALT key captures the current altitude. Again, we can use the nose down up wheel here. If the captured altitude needs to be adjusted, simply roll the down up wheel in the desired direction. Each click now amounts to 10 feet of altitude change with a maximum adjustment available of 150 feet in either direction. As with the GFC 500, the level key activates a tremendous safety feature that should be brief to passengers. Pressing this key will turn the autopilot on, bring the vertical speed to zero, and bring the wings to level. So this is very useful for recovery from an upset condition. It's also useful in heavy turbulence encounters and can be used as a timeout if mode confusion ensues. A control wheel steering, or CWS, provides a remotely mounted, I'm sorry, requires a remotely mounted button. Pressing this button momentarily disengages the autopilot servos while leaving the autopilot on, which allows you to hand fly for a short period without dropping your selected autopilot modes. In this case, you'll see the AP LED flashing in green while using CWS. Once you release the button, the autopilot resumes in the selected modes. Another button that's remotely mounted is the GA or go around button. Pressing this button pitches the nose up to a designated pitch attitude while leaving the wings level. And you'll see GA displayed for both lateral and vertical modes. With GTN navigators, it also activates the missed approach procedure, enabling you to select nav to have the autopilot fly the full program missed approach all while remaining on autopilot. Just be sure to add power and clean up the airplane while you're at it. To get the most out of the GFC 600, your Garmin Aviation team recommends the G500-600 integrated glass panels, or the new TXI series, again, that was announced today. These provide flight director command bars, autopilot mode indication and alerts, heading, altitude, and indicated airspeed, and vertical speed reference marks, or bugs, as well as bank limit indications for ESP, navigation source selections, and includes an air data computer. Of course, there are many more features to the suite of glass panels that go beyond our discussion here today. To get the most out of your overall system, we also recommend the GTN 650-750 touchscreen navigator series. Although the GFC 600 can also interface with other 
Garmin GPS-based navigators, as well as a long list of third-party products that are, that are supported. You can even interface the GFC 600 with a VHF-only navigation source if desired. And the system interfaces with several common HSIs and DGs. If no air data computer is available for interfacing with the system, Garmin has a solution in the form of a small air data module that attaches to the backplate of the GMC 605 mode controller. And while the smart servos used in the GFC 600 have similar features to those used in the 500 system, these are more robust in design and have been environmentally hardened to provide for harsher operating conditions, typically encountered by high performance aircraft. The GFC 600 autopilot system has a long list of available features and functions. And to maximize the features available to you, we do recommend going Garmin all the way. This matrix, while fairly detailed, describes the requ requirements for feature functionality. So both the GFC 500 and the GFC 600 provide a more cost-effective retrofit solution, offering a lower cost of ownership, and will provide a precise and smooth flying experience. Again, for those of you with experience with the GFC 700, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. While providing with a robust set of features that include safety features that you just aren't going to find elsewhere, especially not in a, in a retrofit autopilot system. So at this time, it's uh, time to answer some of those questions. Uh, again, Matt's been kind enough to uh, compile some of these for us so we can answer them for you. Um, and don't forget if we don't answer a question now or you have a request that, that wasn't submitted during the webinar, by all means, uh, send an email to the uh, address at the upper right of the screen. So, first question here we have is, will the GFC 600 interface with Aspen displays? And the answer there is yes, it can interface with the Aspen, uh, is that the EFD, EFD 1000? Okay, so that, uh, that's an affirmative answer. Um, VNAV versus LPV. Uh, that was a question, what, what's the difference here? Um, both autopilots can, ply, can fly LPV approaches with a, an appropriate navigator system. Um, VNAV is um, in reference to in route climb and descent planning. So for example, if you told to cross 35 miles north of a fix where you could go in and program uh, an altitude at that at a, that point, and then the system can build a, a vertical navigation profile for you that you, the autopilot could capture. Again, that's a growth uh, function at this time. And Matt, did we have any other specific questions come up? Okay, so that was uh, that was the big questions, and uh, that's at this point, I think we'll just turn it back over to our good friend at uh, Sporties. Al, thanks a lot. Thanks to both you and Matt uh, for fielding so many of the questions that came in and for all the uh, fantastic information that uh, the community can can use to better evaluate um, the options uh, for the potential autopilot retrofits. As a reminder, um, like we said in the beginning, tonight's presentation was recorded. Um, so you'll, you will be able to see all that detail again and view and review back at sporties.com slash webinars and also on the Sporties YouTube channel. While you visit sporties.com slash webinars, we would certainly invite you to uh, take a look at any of the upcoming presentations um, that you may be interested in for the remainder of the calendar year. Uh, there's some up for uh, each of the remaining months. Um, so we're, we're thankful for you joining us tonight, and hopefully we can see you back on in, in another presentation in the very near future. With that, for both Al Matson and Matt Clark and the entire Garmin Aviation Training Team, my name is Eric Radke from Sporties. Thank you for joining, safe flying, and everyone have a great night.